Today we are going to be talking about the critical race theory. You can go ahead to the first slide. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with one of the founders. His name is Derek Bell. He developed critical race theory in the mid 1970s. He was a lawyer, professor, and civil rights activist. He first began to question American culture and the structure um, of African Americans' rights after the civil rights movement. He believed everything has been produced by institutional racism and basically gets passed on. Um, in 1971, Bell became the first African-American to become a tenured professor at Harvard Law School. He then established a course in civil rights law and he wrote a couple of different books, but he left Harvard um, and to become the first dean of the University of Oregon Law School, but he left Oregon because he wanted to protest against them not hiring Asian American candidates for part of their faculty. But then he returned to Harvard Law School and then again protested when they refused to hire minority females. He is basically prominently known for um, his work inside the classroom, developing critical race theory, um, his um, writing books, and um, basically everything that he kind of did with the movement. He made very important theoretical contributions um, and including arguing the landmark civil rights case, um, Brown versus Board of Education. And he felt like it was a result of self-interest of the elite whites instead of a desire to desegregate schools and improve education of black children. So one of the main things that he really thought about in critical race theory was basically that the rights that um, minorities and like black people were getting weren't really necessarily to benefit black people. It was more so just to, um, it was more so with the self-interest of the elite white people. You can go, yeah, thank you. So a couple other prominent people within critical race theory would be Crimberly Crenshaw and Richard Delgado. Um, critical race theory was basically a response by legal scholars with the idea that United States had become a colorblind society where racial inequality and discrimination was no longer in effect. Um, Basically, they believe that we construct our, our social world with words, stories, and silence. Um, they basically attempt to confront the beliefs and practices that enable racism to persist while also challenging these practices in order to seek liberation for systematic racism. So one of the main things that Kimberly is known for, she's the lady up on the right-hand side. I know we all kind of like pictures, so I included those. Um, she's well known for coming up with the term intersectionality. So that basically means to highlight the multiple and overlapping systems of oppression that people face. So like people of color, people with different sexualities, um, people from different social classes, things like that. Um, that they face that make their experience different from that of white people because within critical race theory scholars believe that the modern power structures exist to keep white males in power and then on the next slide these are just basically common questions that people think about when they're looking for critical race theory or when they're applying critical race theory. Basically what it's doing is trying to make you question and rethink the process of the way that we look at race and how it's culturally um, concepted. So basically what critical race theory is, is a theoretical and interpretive mode that examines the appearance of race and racism across dominant culture modes of expression. So critical race theory really tries to attempt to understand how victims of systematic racism are affected by cultural preconceptions of race and how they can represent themselves to counter prejudice. So what critical race theory does is highlight racism and prejudice in common components of American life. It basically is asking people to challenge um, themselves to examine and attempt to understand the social cultural forces that shape how and others perceive, experience, and respond to racism. It's the notion that race is a social construct, essentially, which means that race has no scientific basis or biological reality. Instead, what critical race theory proposes is that race is a way to differentiate human beings in by being a social concept, a product of a human of a human thought. Um, it's innately hierarchical. 
article, basically what it means is um, it's produced by a human concept. Of course, that doesn't mean that there's no physical differences between people from different regions of the world. It just basically means that there's absolutely no behavior or personality inherent to a white, black, Asian, Indian, Mexican, Latino, South African, any sort of person. This is just all something that was self-constructed by typically a white person because of the way of the social structure of our society. And then on the next side, these are a couple of important terms for critical race theory. The first one would be white privilege and then microaggressions, institutionalized racism, social construction, which is also one of the most important ones within uh, critical race theory. It basically goes over what I kind of talked about in the previous slide. It basically refers to the notion that race is a product of social thoughts and relations, and it suggests that race is a product of neither biology nor genetics, but is rather a social invention. And then the last really important term would be intersectionality, which I talked about previously that, Krim that Kimberly Crenshaw created um, a couple years back. It's just basically the blend of um, people that su suffer from different forms of oppression and how they live their life. And then on the next slide, Um, so how is this theory applied to um, media texts? Basically, media texts would be considered literature, legal documents, movies, um, and they're all basically examples of American culture and collective values and beliefs. And uh, Mariah, I'm going to take over from here. I'm going to be comparing critical race theory and Get Out. So I'm sure most people have seen Get Out, but if not, it's like a horror thriller film about a white family who kidnaps black people to perform this brain surgery on them to make them live longer. And it really talks about like, or shows like white power and white privilege in the 21st century racism. Um, so this white family, they have like these, they have black workers for them and they're basically their slaves because they're hypnotized and they don't really know like what's going on. They just know that like they have to work there, they have to follow what these white people say. Um, and they throw this like this party with a bunch of other white people. And it's basically a party so that these white people can look at the black eyes, in this case it was Chris, and see their physical advantages and like what they can benefit from this ban. Um, and then one of the aspects that I thought was very interesting was in this film, if you can see on the right, there's two photos of the same guy that got kidnapped in the very beginning of the movie. And it was a stereotype that they made because if you're clean shaven, then you look less threatening. And in the very first image when he was kidnapped, he had a beard and facial hair and he apparently looked threatening then. So I thought this was a good example to compare. Um, it's a film that most people knew about. But the next. And then I also compared it to The Lion King um, so this movie was set in Africa, and I'm sure most people have seen it again. It, it's two brothers, one of them Mufasa, who's the king and ruler. He's heterosexual, and he rules where the light touches, which is basically anything above ground, like other than like the elephant graveyard area. And then the other brother, Scar, who's villain, and they portray him as gay. Um, and a lot of people think that. I didn't get that when I first watched it, but Watching back and reading like the reviews about it, it's become like a thing. Um, he rules the underclass wasteland, which is like the elephant graveyard. No one wants to live there. It consists of like the hyenas and the underclass. And as I was researching, it was also described that the underclass, um, the hyenas especially, were described to have African American and Mexican accents, which I thought was interesting to um, put the minorities basically in the very bottom where nobody wants to go. Um, and then another thing I noticed was that when Mufasa was killed by Scar, Scar, um, banished Simba and his once great kingdom turned into like the dark underground, almost like he infected it with his gayness and corruption in a sense. Um, and then one question that I was going to do, if you can see these pictures, was the difference that I noticed between Mufasa and Scar. Um, and one of those was the coloring of them. Scar seems to have 
much darker features in Simba and for them being brothers, I thought that was interesting to make the evil one darker. That was just a tip that I saw. And then to Noah. So now we go to a film that was called Tongues Untied. This uh, um, was directed by Marlon T. Riggs. Um, the movie was initially made in 1989 and it aired on several uh, um, local uh, channels. It, since it was made in San Francisco, it was uh, viewed on KQED and that is an educational channel. Uh, it uh, specifically uh, goes into what it's like to be black and gay at the same time and it uh, takes a dive into Castro Street and it is a man who travels there it, that's what it starts out with and it goes into other a uh, bunch of other people's personal stories um, from this uh, show Tons on Tide I believe we can uh, learn what it's like to be gay and black and from my uh, research uh, all blacks actually have to deal with um, the things that are seen in Tongues Untied. Uh, they have to deal with these things in regular public and private settings, um, sometimes with partners, sometimes in regular settings like uh, when you go into a bar, you're not let in. I know that was one of the stories in the, um, in the show Tons on Tide. Uh, in this, we see a lot of uh, homophobia, racism, and marginalization. It uh, breaks down the LGBTQ culture with um, certain um, art forms and um, uh, cultural behavior such as the snap diva, poetry, marches, dancing, etc. We see a lot of different things in there. Um, uh, so I just want to I, I want to remind you all about the poetry. I think is one that we definitely get throughout the entire um, show. There's um, certain parts where they break it down with poetry, and you'll hear very creative lyricism in there. Um, explaining the uh, issues in uh, what it's like to be black in the gay culture in San Francisco. Because it was um, back in 1989, it was one thing to be gay in San Francisco, and it's uh, another thing to be black and gay. Um, people, um, black men were coming into the gay community and even getting, um, being gay was already tough for them. And then coming into the gay culture, they were even not let in by the gay culture in San Francisco. So it, it's, it's even tougher to be black and gay. And we saw a lot of that um, in the old times in, Francisco, in San Francisco. And I'm sure we see it less now, but we still do see it since it's um, racism still does strongly exist in parts of the US. We see it in many different pockets and places. Um, personal stories are also given uh, in this uh, Tongues Untied film. Um, we do have a young man, he gets harassed and beat for his uh, sexuality, and he's left uh, bloody in the street. Um, I want to remind you all that someone who came up to him and saved him was actually a young white boy, and he speaks of this young white boy and, and how beautiful he was in the situation because he came and helped him. And that is something that um, white culture um, should be learning to do and seeking to do is to um, be helpful and be um, uh, the difference in some situation like that because we see a lot of um, black men that get harassed and other white people stay quiet. They don't speak up um, for um, the black man in the situation because they're nervous or they don't, um, they're too scared. So I think it's important. I think that looking at that particular story in Tongues Untied represents um, the right thing to to do, not harass a gay black person, but to be the one that helps them and steps in and uh, helps them overcome that situation. Um, it's a very unfortunate thing um, to see in society, you know, to be gay and then black and then someone harass you just as you're walking down the street. It's not, it's not correct, but it's things that actually happened in the past. And I'll just leave it at that for that one.